Hey everyone, Mecha here. Welcome to this Fire Emblem 7 Iron Man guide. In this video, I'm going to walk you through every Fire Emblem 7 map and point out what is likely to go wrong in an Iron Man run and how you can mitigate these risks. And if you guys like that and you want more of these, then let me know down below. For those of you that don't know, an Iron Man playthrough means you don't reset the game. You play through a chapter and if you happen to lose a unit along the way, you have to play on and tough it out without them. This can be really painful, but I've also found it a very rewarding way to play. It forces you to use units you haven't really used before, step out of your comfort zone a little bit, so I highly recommend trying some Iron Man run someday. But I'm sure that even if you're not Iron Manning, then this guide will teach you something new about the game. Now, FE7 is not the best or the easiest game to Iron Man first. I would say the title goes to FE6, FE8, FE9, and the Shadow Dragon remake. But FE7 recently came out on Nintendo Switch Online, and it's a game that I'm very familiar with, so I thought it would be good to cover in this first guide. I've played three Fire Emblem 7 Iron Mans, I've failed two of them, two game overs on the exact same chapter, then I finished the third one on 0% growth, so you could say I have some experience with the game. Now this guide is going to be focused on the hardest difficulty, Hector Hard Mode. Uh, you do have to beat the game twice to unlock it, so if you don't have that yet, uh, this can still be useful to you because the other difficulties are just easier versions of this. Some apps are vastly different. If you prefer to play another difficulty, go ahead. Most general tips will still apply, but Hector Hard Mode is just one step more difficult. This is not going to be an in-depth walkthrough. I'm not going to go through a step-by-step -step guide on how to beat every single chapter. Uh, I'm going to go over things that I think are likely to go wrong, specifically in Iron Man setting. Now, I would not recommend Iron Manning a game blindly on your first playthrough, so for this guide, I'm generally going to assume that you've played the game at least once. So um, yeah, let's get into it. Uh, we're going to be doing this mostly on the website WOD, FireEmblemWOD.com, stands for uh, Wars of Dragons, I do believe. It's a Spanish website, but if you go to the top right here, you can change it, the text to English if you want to. It makes it easier to comprehend. There's other useful resources like Cernus Forest, uh, like Moifi on uh, Discord. It's a Discord bot that lets you check stats for stuff. Uh, TriangleTag.com is another really good one to check stuff. I'm going to use WOD for right now. Uh, it's pretty easy to point out stuff on the map on it, so we're going to do that. So, yeah, let's get into Chapter 11 of uh, Hector Mode. Uh, you only have two units, so there's not too much to say on strategy itself, but it does introduce a couple of things that I think are useful to highlight in an Iron Man one, <laughs> Iron Man run. Now, this chapter is a good introduction to risk management, uh, how to, like, risk, whether to risk your units to get some treasure. For example, uh, the chest over here has a red gem. Matthew can get it from the chest, but it's also an enemy thief going for it, so you have to be kind of fast to get it. And the question the game is asking you is, how much are you willing to risk your units over trying to get this treasure. So uh, something that might be useful to know for that is that enemy thief AI is kind of peculiar and if you know about it, it's exploitable in some ways. Uh, this enemy thief will try to steal your things if he can, so a vulnerable from Hector or even Matthew's lockpick if he can. Uh, they can only steal if their speed is equal or better. So I think he usually ties Matthew's base speed. So keep that in mind. Uh, but the thief will try to steal your things, or if he can't steal anything, then he will try to unlock the closest door or chest and run towards that. Even if he can just escape with the treasure uh, or attack someone, he will want to open all the doors. So keep that in mind. You can keep him on the map for longer than, you, than he might want to. Uh, steal the lockpick back and forth with Matthew if you feel like it. Uh, bait him away from the chest or bait him away from uh, escaping. Stuff like that. Uh, something about Matthew. He is your only thief that you're going to have for a while, so you want to be very careful with him. Don't risk him dying. Even if his avoid chances look good, uh, don't risk him because you won't get another thief for at least eight maps. And there's a lot of treasure on the way, both stealable and in chests, and you don't really get any keys to replace him for a while. So keep, take good care of him. You might want to level him up a bit if you can do so safely. Uh, he starts with 11 speed at base. If you leveled up in, in limb mode because you played that beforehand, that's great. But if you did not, then you'll probably want to get at least 12 speed by chapter 18 and 13 speed by 19xx. So that's one or two points over the course of eight chapters. It's very doable if you're conscious of it. Uh, so do keep that in mind. You don't have to remember those benchmarks exactly. Just remember you need like one or two level ups of speed on Matthew. He's like a 60% growth, so it's not very unlikely to go wrong. So if you him two or three levels, he'll probably get there. And you don't have many units in your other games, so it's not even going to cost you anything. So, yeah, that's all I have to say right now about Chapter 11. Let's move on to Chapter 12. Okay, so Chapter 12, the most important thing about this map is you get Marcus here. Uh, Marcus in Iron Man is, as he is in any run, a godsend. Use Marcus to make things safe. If you don't want to feed him all the kills, I completely understand that because he does get very little XP. His growths aren't very good, but 
if your units are having trouble killing the enemies or you anticipate that there's like a very hectic turn to come up like just feel free to let marcus make your life easier by killing a lot of things or killing a couple enemies or at the very least rescue someone with him have him weaken enemies for you and then kill them off but honestly i recommend leaving your units unrescued just use marcus to kill things when it makes things easier this chapter you probably won't need to do too much um but it's good to keep in mind Oswin is kind of similar in a sense that, like, yeah, he starts higher leveled, but he's really good in the early game, so you just use it whenever he can. Uh, but Marcus is the main thing. Keep him alive and uh, keep using him. Uh, also important, you get Eliwood here. And Eliwood is a character that can die and then give you a game over condition. So now it's probably a good time to talk about the difference between a soft and a hard Iron Man. Um, because, like I said, an Iron Man is, is a run where you don't reset. Uh, soft Iron Mans are willing to reset a map if you get a game over. Uh, whereas a hard Iron Man means if you get a game over, the run is over. You just have to, if you want to play the game again, you have to start over from the beginning. So that adds some extra challenge and stakes. Do whatever you think is most fun for you. There's nothing wrong with playing either of these. If added stakes are something you want, then do a hard Iron Man. If you want to experience as much of the game as possible, do a soft Iron Man. FE7 has a couple of chapters where a game over is more likely to happen, sometimes out of the player's control. So that's why I think it's a little worse than most games to hard Iron Man, but overcoming these difficulties can be satisfying. And one of those difficulties is the fact that Eliwood can die. Hector technically provides a game over too, but he's less likely to die because he's more durable. Uh, but Eliwood is a lot more fragile, and while Hector is forced into every map, meaning you have an incentive to train him, Eliwood is only forced into some maps, and that's maps are like Dragon's Gate and the Vida Chapter and Sands of Time, so he's extra hard to keep safe if you don't train him. Generally, training him is going to be a bit difficult and will probably risk his death more than if you don't train him and only have to deal with him for a couple chapters, and I think roughly the same goes for Lin, so if you were on the fence, I would recommend not training Eliwood. But if you're someone who likes Eliwood, then feel free to train him. He's not bad, uh, but it adds a little bit of extra risk to a hard arm, man, if you're using Eliwood all the time. And if you do train him, then the map's where he's forced. It's going to be easier to keep him alive, I think. So, um, yeah, that's chapter 12. Other than that, I don't really want to get into, like, basic Fire Emblem strategy, like checking ranges, doing math. Um, I'm assuming you roughly know how to do that if you're playing Fire Emblem a little bit. Um, that's really just the basics of it, is, like, check things. This guy is going to be focused on keeping things safe and as risk-free for you as possible. If that's not your thing, if you like risks, if you like things going wrong occasionally, if you're willing to see some deaths, uh, if you want to make it extra spicy, if you're making YouTube content, perfectly understandable to make things a little bit more risky. This guide, I think, is most helpful for people who maybe failed an Iron Man run and want to prepare themselves better for the future, uh, or people who just like to go in more prepared, or people who want to mitigate risk for some other way, other reason. But I'm going to be focused on keeping things safe. Uh, or at least show you the options you have to keep it safe if you want to. So that's going to be the, the spirit of the guide. With that in mind, what I recommend doing here is sending Marcus through here to the top part of the map to help out Oswin and Hector, because there's less units here than there are here, and there's more enemies coming here than there are here. So that makes it a lot easier. With that in mind, let's uh, move on to the next chapter. Okay, chapter 13, there are two paths that you can take in this chapter. Uh, one of them is through the left here, uh, over this breakable snag, and the other one is going down here, where Marcus is in this screenshot, and just going here. Uh, both routes have their advantages and disadvantages, but overall I would say that the left route is much easier. It's kind of cramped, because there's a lot of like one or two wide choke points, not a whole lot of room here. Uh, but there's also only one cavalier on this island, a couple of Pegasus Knights coming at you, and that's going to be it for the first half of the map, basically. Um, it does mean that it will be a little bit harder to get Gi, but eventually he will move up towards you. And you can recruit him with Matthew from there. So uh, I wouldn't worry too much about that. You'll have to improvise a little bit, but overall it's the easier route to take. If you do go down this path, then you'll probably want to make some use of Marcus to clear out enemies, because it's going to get quite cramped in here uh, with these four enemies here. And then these enemies will only move if you trigger them. Uh, Guy does not outmove Matthew, so what you can do is once you've cleared out the enemies, you put Matthew six away from Guy, for example, on the fort over here. And then next turn, you just walk him over and recruit him. You don't have to risk a killing edge crit on one of your units to bait him safely, so I wouldn't do that. Uh, that is a disaster for, like, a, re a recipe for disaster. Um, don't worry too much about this village. It's just a mine. You can lose that if you want to. Uh, if you save it, great. If not, whatever. Uh, but you do want to get this village because it has a torch, and it unlocks the next guy in chapter, so you do want to get that. Um, there was one more other thing about this map that I wanted to say. Oh, yeah, you can... Um, you can end it whenever you want because it's a seize map, it's not a route map like the last chapter. And what that means is you have the option to grind supports. And 
Generally, I think this will make the game a lot easier to the point where I recommend not doing it, but if you're having a lot of trouble with the game, this should be something you can consider. Uh, so most units in the game that you have right now have at least one support that you can build up. Uh, a really fast one, for example, is Eliwood and Hector. Uh, they have a good affinity together. They give each other like good defensive bonuses. And their support is very fast. You can get to a C within a matter of three turns and then to a B if you just mash and turn a couple times or a couple of like 20, 30 times, I don't remember. Uh, you can do that stuff if you want to. I don't recommend it for your first run. I'd recommend trying without it first, but if you're having a lot of trouble, then grinding supports is a great way to do it. Uh, just clear out all the enemies, uh, including the boss, and then just mash and turn a couple times. You, what you should do, and what you should, what I do recommend, is making sure that your inventories are up to scratch for the next chapter. Uh, the most important thing, I think, is giving the torch you get from this village, uh, give it to Matthew. Um, I'll get into more of it why, but that's one thing you should do. Because you don't have battle preparations for next chapter, you don't get to trade out around items for free, so just do it here. And other than that, if you're buying stuff at this armory, give it to the right people. Um, maybe give like Hector an Iron Axe if he doesn't have one already, because he only has a Wolfbeal and a Hand Axe to start out with. Give Marcus some one to range options if he doesn't have them already. Stuff like that. Uh, generally, this is like the only armory in a while that has Javelins and Hand Axes, which are just very useful. So I would recommend buying a couple here. Uh, you can sell the Secret Book you got from last chapter. Uh, you can sell the Red Gem if you still have it. Um, you can sell it with Rapier if you don't plan on using him. All these are like sources of gold for you. Okay, it's chapter 13x, the first guidance chapter of the game. Generally, I recommend going to guidance chapters just to get the complete experience of the game, but there are some that you can skip and probably should skip to make the game easier on yourself, where there's not enough reward to warrant the risk, because it is an extra chapter you can lose a unit in or get a game over in. Uh, but this chapter I recommend playing because it's not super difficult if you play it right, and, you know, it's good practice, and I again, it's more gameplay. More gameplay is more fun, right? Um, for this one, it's Fog of War. You can't see it on this map because they edited it out for the sake of a complete screenshot. But in the game, you can barely see like beyond the first island that you start on and like this part over here. So that's why I recommend putting the torch on Matthew. Matthew has innate vision boost as a thief, but then when he uses his torches, that vision range increases further beyond. <laughs> it's even further beyond. So he'll like reveal almost, I think like half the map is revealed when you use Matthew. And that gives you more information that lets you know where to put your units. Now, this map in particular, the game kind of sets it up in this middle island where it says, okay, try to defend Merlinus against all these enemies coming from all the sides. Um, there's a very cheesy way that I'll get into in a minute to uh, defend Merlinus because doing it here on this island is not recommended. I recommend trying to find another place to do it because enemies can come from like a bunch of different points. Uh, let me see if I can point them out. So there's a member down here, there's an archer here, there's enemies that are going to break the snack, going to come in from here, there's an enemy here. Um, you could retreat up into the island in the middle and like just defend this point, but that's still an extra point to defend. Uh, brigands can move over water, so that can add a little extra difficulty. Um, enemies are coming from here, obviously, and you want to get to this village as well. So that's super difficult to do. Uh, I've definitely had a lot of struggles with that, even in casual play, so don't do that. Uh, find something else. Um, if you want to figure it out yourself, go ahead and skip ahead like 30 seconds, but I'm just going to give away what like the easy solution is. It's a bit cheesy, so that's why I'm like, giving a bit of a spoiler warning. So what you can do, if you want to, is use Blowin' Marcus to grab Mernus and rescue him to this bottom island, and file everyone down. There's a certain order you have to do it in, because it gets quite clogged in here. But you can safely export everyone to the bottom island, and then you just use this choke point to defend against most of the enemies. Um, the enemies will not come through here beyond this first brigands, because they're stupid. Um, they are looking for the easiest path to you, and they think that's through a massive clog of enemies that ends up here. And then you should just focus on getting the village. Uh, the way I usually get the village is to send Marcus through here, uh, break the snag, couple, kill a couple of enemies. He doesn't one round everything, but he can generally just like an iron sword, a vulnerary, and a javelin, and a hand axe. He usually gets through here fine. Um, alternatively, what you can do is invade this brigand island over here at the bottom right. Um, Matthew and Guy are quite good at killing brigands together, even the hand axe ones eventually. So go here, try to cover up the forts if you can. And then someone like Lowen can come in through here and get the village as well. That's an alternative plan to get the village. Something you should be wary of is there are ambush reinforcements in this chapter. I don't know why, because most of the game doesn't have that. Ambush reinforcements means the enemies spawn at the beginning of enemy turn and they get to move before you even get to react to them. Whereas non-ambush spawns, normal reinforcements, they just spawn at the start of player phase so you can see them. Um, particularly the ones in this chapter are kind of annoying because they start in these forests and one of them is a nomad, the other one is a brigand, and they can unexpectedly kill one of your units if you're not careful. Um, so cover those forts in time. Uh, WOD is a great website because it shows exactly when and where the reinforcements will spawn. You literally just have to read the website. So 
generally, I know that looking up things is a bit frowned upon by some people, but for something like an Iron Man, again, if you want to minimize the risk, this is the best way to do it. Uh, I'm not here to tell you what to do and what you can and what you shouldn't do, but I do recommend this if you're having trouble. So do look up the reinforcements, especially I think if it's ambush spawns, I think it's completely fair game to look up the reinforcements ahead of time because there's no other way to react to them. So there you go. That's an option you can do is look up enemies. All right, chapter 14. Um, the first thing I want to remind you of is you should bring Sarah to recruit Urk. If she's dead, you can still recruit him, but Sarah is the easiest way. I said it's not a walkthrough. I'm not going to tell you every single like little thing you can and should do. I'm not going to tell you, hey, visit this village. Hey, uh, get this chest, get this stuff. Uh, I'll tell you like what is important to get, uh, but I'm not going to like walk you through the entire game. But for this kind of thing where you cannot reset after preparations, technically, I think it's good to have a quick reminder. Hey, you should bring this character to recruit this other character. So bring Sarah to recruit Urk. In this chapter, you have deployment slots for everyone, so it's not significant yet, but it will be significant later. Um, if Sarah is dead already, which can happen in Iron Man, there is not a way to get him, which is by recruiting him with Priscilla, who is in this village over here. Speaking of Priscilla, um, the way that people usually play this chapter, or that people used to play this chapter a lot, was sending Marcus down to this village over here. They just like walk him all the way down to the beach to get Priscilla, um, because the village is under attack. Like There's pirates coming from here, there's brigands coming from here, they want to burn down the villages. Fair enough, but you don't have to actually do that. All you have to do to recruit Priscilla is keep the village intact to make sure it doesn't get destroyed. And all that takes is just killing the enemies before they can get to the village. Uh, the enemies will attack you instead of destroying the village if they have a choice between the two. So even if they're next to the village, it's still not over yet. You can still get there. Um, the pirates, you just have to fight them at the beach. Someone like Gear or Matthew can take care of them quite nicely. Uh, these brigands from over here, uh, what you can do to mitigate the chance that they go for Priscilla's village is not visit the Iron Blade village because they like to go for the closest village. So if they're going for here, then they're not going for the bottom village. And I like this because once the rain sets in, it's very hard to catch a brigand before he makes it through this uh, this place over here. So um, it, like you have more distance to cover than they do. So it's generally better to give him this village to... The, even if they have to destroy it, whatever, it's an Iron Blade, who cares? Uh, Priscilla is much more important. So do that, and if your Sarah is dead, then you can still grab Priscilla at some point and have her walk over to Urk. Uh, or, I think if Priscilla is alive at the end of the chapter and Urk is NPC, she still joins, but you should double check that kind of thing. I didn't have that handy. Um, but just know there are options. Um, there are Pegasus Knights that are coming through here that are going after Merlinus. Uh, Merlinus, of course, the, the tent convoy over here. If you keep Merlinus alive for an entire chapter, then he gets a level up. And eventually he gets, earns a promotion. This is not worth sweating over in Iron Man. I don't think there are like places where it's nice if Mernus moves around, but it doesn't really matter that much. So if the choice is of like a risk is like I risk Mernus dying or risk one of my units dying, generally just let Mernus die. But you know, sometimes you have room to spare and you can save him without any opportunity cost. In this case, what I'd like to do is leave the fighters, uh, Dorcas and Bartre, as well as Rebecca behind. They're not super useful for the enemies here for the most part. Uh, you need someone to clear out these soldiers and this armor knight. Um, as well as the Pegasus Knight reinforcements at some point anyway, because it's a route map. So just leave those behind. If they die, uh, there's worse people that can die, right? Like, I like these units for meme reasons, but uh, in an Iron Man, if the choice is between um, someone like Urk or Lowen dying and someone like Dork is dying, I, I'm going to make my choice like that. So um, the Pegasus Knights can be a bit annoying. Sometimes they dodge you, and sometimes they go past you to hit Murnus. If you get them low on health, like I think below 30-50%, they'll also run back to these forts and start healing which, if anything, just wastes your time, and you only have so much time in your life to play Fire Emblem, right? So, probably don't want that to happen. The way I find it works the best is to give Dorcas and Bartrid a couple of Valtteries, uh, have the Pegasus Knights attack into them on enemy phase, and then finish them off on player phase. That gives you the least chances to dodge attacks and do unexpected things to you. Um, but, yeah, again, if they die, there's bigger losses, bigger losses right? Um, so yeah, the reason I'm emphasizing that village and uh, Marcus is because I'm not trying to have Marcus in the middle. If Marcus fights enemies in the middle, it's much easier to play the map because your other units are much worse at fighting. So, um, have Marcus fight things to make things easier, as always. Okay, chapter 15. This is the Fen map, so what you can do to cheese it is just leave Hector on the throne, deploy no one else, like the example says here, and you'll clear the chapter, it takes seven turns, just press seven, and turn seven times, maybe use a vulnerary, that's it. Uh, but you do lose a lot of experience, you do lose the treasure in here, so maybe don't do that if you want to do that, but that is one safe way you can do it. Um, in order to get the treasure, Matthew does have to make a conscious effort to make it here in time. The chapter's only seven turns long, so he has to be here by turn five, get this chest in turn six, and this chest in turn seven at the latest. If you don't do that, you're probably not getting the treasure. 
Uh, maybe you can get it from the enemy thief if he gets there, but he, that probably is about as fast. So make sure to clear out the place in time for Matthew to get the treasure. Um, one good way to clear the map out is to stop the reinforcements, which you can do by killing the boss, uh, Seelan. Uh, Seelan is a nomad with a longbow that moves, so he actually covers like this part of the map, this part, maybe a bit more, but you know, the, you get the point, right? His range is massive. So what I recommend doing with Seelan is you can put Marcus in this spot with a hand axe or a javelin. And I know this works on normal mode, but you should double check if it works on hard mode, probably. Uh, Seelan has a longbow, but if you put Marcus in this spot, uh, this mage is in the way for him to use the longbow, and it's the only spot he can attack with three range from. So he's forced to attack at two range instead. From here, Marcus can counter him, and then you can finish him off with someone else if Marcus doesn't kill somehow. I know like Marcus is borderline with killing and or doubling on normal mode even, so probably uh, misses out on the hard mode kill because Hector hard mode enemies have five extra levels, so he'll be a bit bulkier and a bit faster. So yeah, that's one way you can kind of not cheese the map, but reduce a lot of the strain on it. Uh, by killing Seelan early, because once Seelan is dead, reinforcements will stop spawning, whereas otherwise you get a bunch of reinforcements, as you can see down here. Uh, you don't want those. So, um, that stops reinforcements. Uh, I think the map gives plenty of XP even without reinforcements, like it's plenty tough to defend already, so don't make it harder for yourself. Um, killing Seelan might even take you a couple turns. Uh, generally, I think this, this bottom part is the biggest pain here, because you get a bunch of mercenaries spawning here at some point, and those are really annoying. Uh, this upper part is less difficult because it's just fighters for the most part. There's like one nomad and a bunch of fighters. Fighters are easy to handle. You have like five sword users. All right, chapter 16. I think this map is not too difficult overall. You can kind of take it slow and the only thing that goes wrong is these cavaliers are going to destroy Myrna's, but other than that, it's not super difficult. Uh, the main part to pay attention to is you have another game over condition here in uh, in Lin, and you definitely want to avoid game overing, I think. So the best way to do that is to stop these two Pegasus Knights from harassing her. They have javelins, so Lin can't do a whole lot to them, but Will can. So what you can do is you can put Will, I believe the square is where Sane starts out, that's very easy to remember. Actually, no, I think, yeah, I think that's it. Uh, but just count the squares, uh, you want Will at the exact edge of their range. Um, I can count the squares for you, actually. There you go. Um, a Pegasus Knight can attack Sane at two range on turn one, so just move Will to where he is, and then he will counter them both, he survives both hits. I think there's a chance base Will dies if you don't train Will in limb mode. Uh, if you don't play limb mode, then he should survive at base. And he'll counter them both with a bow, and then you can finish him off with any of these characters, and you're good to go. Uh, you'll want Lin to probably sell her gem, whichever one she comes with. It's depending on your limb mode rank, but if you don't play limb mode, then she just has a blue gem, I think. So just sell that in the armory. Uh, buy like an Iron Lance or two for Kent and Sane, and while you're at it, buy some Javelins and Hand Axes if you haven't already. And even if you have already, you'll want to buy a lot, because this is the last shop that sells Javelins and Hand Axes for a couple chapters. And it's the easiest shop to reach. Um, it costs you literally nothing turn-wise to get some uh, one to range weapons here, which I'm sure you've realized at this point are very, very good. Uh, most of your characters, especially Hector, Oswin, Marcus, uh, Kent and Sane as well. You'll want those for sure. So buy those, they'll be get sent to the convoy over here. And uh, other than that, just play it safe. Um, oh, the, the thieves are kind of interesting in this chapter. They have similar AI to the chapter 11 ones. I think their main priority is to steal from you if they can. Uh, if they cannot, they will move towards the nearest village that hasn't been visited or destroyed yet. So this thief moves towards this village, yet I think he ends up here turn one. It's trivial to get the village turn one with, or turn two with Florina, if you want to. Uh, what you can also do is like trick him into stealing a Vulnerary, and you can steal his lockpick with Matthew, and you can kill him. That's an option you have. Um, but just remember, he has like roughly the same AI as the chapter 11 thief. So if you visit this village, then he'll try to go for this one. If he doesn't go have either one of them, then he'll try to escape. But if he can steal something, I think he will still steal something. Right, chapter 17. Uh, first things first, bring Priscilla to recruit Raven. It's the only way to do it. And then Raven recruits Lucius, of course. If you want those two characters, you need Priscilla, even if you're not training her. So this chapter has the first, I would say, difficult time-sensitive objective, which is the Night Crest. It's in the right-hand chest over here. This one is a silver sword. Um, the Night Crest is worth rushing a little bit, I think, because there's so many somewhat good units that promote using a Night Crest. You know Oswin, but there's also Sane, Kent, um, alone if you're using him. You want that Night Crest probably. It's the only one you get for quite a while. To get that, you have to beat the Thief to it, and the Thief reinforces uh, turn 4 and 5. You get some Thieves from the stairway to open this door, and they open this door, and then they start opening the chests. I believe the Thief open one Thief just escapes, and the other one opens the Silver Sword first, and then he opens the Night Crest. So what you can do is you don't have to make it here by the time he gets the Night Crest or the Silver Sword, uh, but you have to make it here before he tries to escape with it. And then when you kill him, he'll drop the Night Crest. You lose the Silver Sword that way, but the Silver Sword is not that important to like risk things over. 
If you want to make it there quickly enough, you'll probably have to use Marcus a fair bit as you, as you make your way through the corridors. If you try to piece together kills between a bunch of different units, you'll probably go a lot slower. So you want Marcus to like charge ahead, maybe with some help from uh, your other cavalry, and do that. These chests are basically free, uh, just have Matthew get them. It is worth noting that there are cavalier's reinforcements from the bottom left here at some point. I think it's like turn 7, yeah turn 7 is when they come in. Um, they will go for Myrnas first, and then when they've killed Myrnas, they'll work their way up. If you play this chapter kind of slowly, for example, if you're waiting for Matthew to make his way back up to get the chests, for example, then you'll probably run into trouble with these reinforcements, so you probably want to get out of there before that happens, or leave someone behind to guard them. Uh, Oswin is perfect. Because the chapter is kind of fast-paced, he's not going to keep up with his four moves, so just move him back down once he's done, like, helping out over here. And you can kill the Cavaliers easily, get a bunch of experience, and you don't have to worry about it anymore. Uh, if you have to move Oswin up here to help out, if for some reason you don't have a Myrna's Guard, then it's worth thinking about how you're going to keep Matthew safe. Because <laughs> uh, they'll eventually make its way over to the treasure room and trap him there inside. I've seen that gone wrong a couple times. Um, also, if you rush the chapter, uh, it also makes it easier to recruit Raven before something goes wrong here. Uh, particularly what can happen is the soldiers at some point, they break out of the cell. Uh, they open his door and start charging out. And they can get kills by like, killed by like archers over here. So make sure to stop that. Um, if you want to stop the enemy archers from spawning, you'll have to open a door, or when the door is opened by the thief, uh, go inside and block the stairway. This is something you can do um, if you're fast enough. But it, it's a bit of a tricky spot, but just calmly figure out your options and you'll, you'll be good. Um, not, not a very hard chapter. Oh, killing the boss stops reinforcements. So if you want to stop the flow of cavaliers and nomads coming from the bottom left, you can kill him. Uh, I would recommend using the wolf beal or the hammer from this fighter. Um, Give to Marcus, he will like one out the boss, I think. Now, if you saved at least one of the NPC soldiers, you get to go to this chapter. And I really recommend this one because, worst case scenario, it's 100% free. You just get all the rewards with no risk if you just have Florian get the villages and then fly up to Fargus and talk to him. Uh, you can see they even indicate how you can do it uh, on WOD, which is very nice of them. Uh, this, this black line shows where you can go without aggroing the pirates. Uh, but if you go within that black zone, if you end your turn anywhere in there, then um, Florina or uh, Fargus will be like, hey, uh, you, you daft lots, and then all these guys will charge you. Obviously, the safest way to play this chapter is to go through the north, um, kill the pirates there. They're lower level. Some of the high level pirates charge you initially, I think, plus Damien charges you anyway. But it's much easier to handle them when they're coming up here with all these choke points than it is to fight them in the middle here where like there's a bunch of high level enemies. Then when you do arrive here, you do have the option of baiting enemies one by one. Uh, if you just check ranges a little bit properly, uh, they can attack from the village at range, this mage and this uh, archer and this shaman. So you can put a two range character here, and as long as they don't one round, they should be safe. Watch out for the Kidabo archer, because he can crit you, and triple damage might kill you. I think Marcus can survive a crit, but that might depend on his stats. So um, probably use Osmond for him. Um, generally just try to make sure not, you, not to one round to suffer from success, and you'll be fine baiting from two range. And then I think you can use that forest to bait some of them. Uh, let me count the squares to make sure. So one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, so this pirate, I think is the one with the killer axe, um, but it might be a different one. Uh, you can bait him at one range, he'll go here. So once the two range enemies are dead, this is the only square he can attack from. So that's outside of Fargus's range, which means he just comes up individually, and then you can start baiting the other ones one by one as well. This is a bit risky, but it is a lot of experience, so it might be worth it. Uh, up to you though, but do make sure to get all the treasure with Florina at least if she's alive. You can probably still get most of it, even if you don't have Florina. Um, if for some reason you want to get the houses um, without killing all the pirates here, and you're worried about doing it safely, put someone in range to talk to Fargus, then get the houses on the same turn as you talk to Fargus, and the enemies will never get the chance to catch you. Okay, Pirate Ship. This is one of the hardest maps in the game, in my opinion. This is super hard in Iron Man specifically, because there are two win conditions, but they're both kind of tricky. Uh, the first win condition is to kill the boss, Zoldem, over here. Uh, the problem with Zoldem is that he has a Luna Tome, and Luna has high crits, and he has high enough magic to the point where if he crits with Luna, all your units die. The only way to survive a Luna crit is like if you train Dorcas, like super high level, I'm talking like level 20 promoted, and then maybe even needs a robe if he gets unlucky, um, he might survive Luna, but no one else does, not even Marcus. So you can end the map in, I would say, about three turns with Marcus, if you move him full move towards Zoldem and kill him in turn three. And if he doesn't get crit by Luna, that's the easiest way to clear the map. But if he does get crit by Luna, then your Marcus dies, which is horrible because he's by far your best unit. So don't want that to happen, then we have to defend the chapter. And the easiest place to defend on this chapter is to be a bit aggressive, I think, uh, which is choking the points here and here. 
Uh, now, unfortunately, these are both about eight tiles away from their closest starting positions. I have counted before. So while Marcus can make it here, the question is who's going to do this one? Uh, there's a couple ways to accomplish this. The easiest one is to promote a Paladin in Limb Mode or Hector Mode uh, with the Nightcrest you just got and uh, have them do it. Unfortunately, that is a bit risky because there are a bunch of enemies on the ship. I'm not sure how your crew at this point is leveled up. That's the thing about an army. You don't know what you have access to. But I found it pretty tricky to kill all these enemies initially um, with the units you have. Because, like, sure, Marcus can kill this Shaman. And probably someone else can kill this Shaman with the Mercs require two units each. And you only have so many deployment slots. One of them is probably Matthew because you want to steal the Legion Whip from the Pegasus Knight over here. And you might want to steal the Guy Ring from Zoldum as well. Uh, so you might not have enough combat units to clear out the ship. Plus you can miss out against the mercenary. They're kind of dodgy. So uh, figuring that out is a bit of a puzzle, but that's what makes it fun. If you can get these choke points, it's going to be a lot easier. Because if you don't, then these archers and mercenaries and Pegasus Knights are all going to move up to you without you having the ability to clear them out early. Like, if you can clear this platform over here um, and the Pegasus Knights run up to you, then you're going to have an easier time killing them or not putting your characters in a vulnerable spot. But if you fail to choke that point, I find out what's like most, the next best strategy is to try to choke around the stairs somewhere. And what can happen here is, first of all, your units are very cramped up here, so it's kind of difficult to move them around to have them do what they need to do. And the other problem is that there's more spaces you can get attacked from by more enemies that make it through. The Pegasus Knights will make it over to the middle of the ship for free, and then they can attack from a bunch of different spaces. Uh, the Pegasus do get hindered by these masts, so keep that in mind. They can't move over those, they have to move around. Uh, but also keep in mind that enemies can stand on these shops over here and attack your characters at range if they're standing where Hector is, for example. So that can catch you off guard and kill one of your units. I know that like one of my patrons mentions that this actually happened to him. So uh, if you're choking on these stairs, keep that in mind. You do have Oswin and Marcus to like perfectly choke these two points, of course. And that's, you know, that's good. Uh, they'll like defend themselves pretty well. Uh, Oswin can survive like one or two shamans, I'm pretty sure. And Marcus survives just about everything. So you can do that. But my favorite approach, if you can, is to do these two choke points. It's just It takes a lot of figuring out to do. But it's a good exercise, and especially if you're willing to tackle like harder maps later in other Fire Emblem games, then this is definitely a good warm-up for that. Actually, there's one more thing. Uh, these shops are also the last opportunity to shop before the Dread Isle arc, which is, well, depending on like how many guiding chapters you go to, it might be like two or three chapters long. So make sure you have enough hand axes, javelins, iron lances, iron weapons, basically, uh, to get through a couple long maps. Uh, chapter 19, the Dread Isle. This one, I think, is a bit intimidating because of the Fog of War, but it's less difficult than the Pirate Ship. Uh, bring Florina to recruit Fiora. Now uh, you can see here where she spawns. She'll go off and like hit something. You can recruit her next turn if you put Florina roughly where she starts out. It's kind of hard for her to fly out of Florina's range if Florina's like right next to where she spawns. Uh, there's a 15 turn limit if you want to get the Guiding Chapter after this, which you do. Um, it might be that might sound a bit harsh, but it's not actually super difficult to defeat the boss Uhai in 15 turns. Even if you have to get Oswin all the way over there, I found it's not that difficult. Um, just keeping in mind that you're not able to just turtle infinitely if you want to get the guy in chapter. Um, there is a thief here with a torch staff that he drops. Um, he's all the way over here and he'll make his way down like this. You've probably seen it if you played the game before. Uh, not worth risking your neck over, not at all. Uh, the torch staff, I mean, it's nice, but you get another opportunity to get them. You get a shop in like three, four chapters. There's not a fog map in between, um, but you also have probably still have a thief and a torch item to clear fog of war so this torch staff it's a bit risky to get sometimes because you have to blindly charge into the fog like you kind of need marcus to move full move almost every turn to catch him um we would not recommend getting um what i do recommend you go for is these reinforcements over here uh the left ones are pirates and the right ones are pegasus knights you can see there's a couple more pegasus knights over here knowing where they are is half the battle so again for fog of war bring a thief and bring the torch item uh if you can preempt them by which I mean uh, put someone in a spot where they can enemy phase that enemy and just kill them on enemy phase. That's going to be so much easier for you than trying to like react to them as they go into your rage. And you have to take care of them or they'll kill like one of your more fragile units. So they are like weighed down a lot. I think they have steel lances or javelins. So put someone like Dart with an Iron Axe or like a Hand Axe in range or like Hector or someone else who can use axes. And just clear them on enemy phase. It's much easier. Similarly with these pirates, they'll try to make their way onto the bitch. I think... I didn't... <laughs> I think you can um, put literally Eddie Wood or like Ghee or someone with a sword in his forest and they'll just take care of the pirates by themselves. As long as no one else is like in their range, they'll just keep suicide into them. 
great way to train Aylward if you're doing that. Um, pretty comfy, would recommend. Uh, much better than, again, trying to react to them. Other than that, I mean, the Nomads and stuff are pretty annoying. Um, but they don't do much damage per hit. Uh, use Oswin, use Marcus. That's pretty much the best way to get through this chapter safely. So before we move on to the next chapter, I do want to talk about Uhai in depth real quick. Uh, he's in the bottom right. He's on a forest. He has a killing edge, a short bow, and a long bow. And uh, he's kind of fast with 13 speed. Not actually that fast. He can never double Marcus at full speed. Uh, but, you know, faster than most bosses so far. He is uh, tough to do safely. What I'd recommend, of course, is uh, Oswin with a Horse Slayer, uh, Marcus with Silver Lance, those are the safest bets. I think if Marcus levels up some HP defense, then he can survive the Killing Edge crit, thanks to Weapon Triangle. And Oswin can sometimes survive two crits, maybe, depending on defense, I don't know. Uh, he probably does have to be promoted, though. So those are the safest options to one-range him. Now, if you can't or don't want to do that, there are other ways to do it. Um, you can force him to use his short bow or his long bow. Uh, I recommend the long bow because it doesn't have crit. Um, so put them at like three range from Uhai. You can put them in these these forests over here. That'd be here, uh, here, here. One of these squares. Put someone there that can kind of take a hit, like maybe one of your calves, and then uh, he long bows them. And then you can go up close from one of these two squares and him with the wolf beal or the manikari or the silver lance or whatever you want, and you can kind of take him down that way. Uh, it's not likely you'll kill him that way right away because he can, he can miss. Uh, he does have like significant HP defense because he's a boss and he's on a forest. So what you might have to do is hit him at one range, then rescue that character out and drop them somewhere else where Uhai can't crit them with the killing edge. Of course, if you do this, keep in mind that there are forests all around you and if you're using Cavaliers to shuffle people around, then they might get stuck in the forests. So remember, it takes them three moves to move through a forest. So if you move through two forests, you cannot move into another one. So be careful about that. Don't get stuck and uh, killing edge by Uhai because you miscalculated the ranges. Uh, just in general with Uhai, assume the worst case scenario. You're going to miss. He's going to crit you maybe even twice. What are you going to do about it? Um, can you survive that? If not, can you? do you want to take the risk? If you don't want to take that risk, how do you get yourself out of the risk? And then you have to do that within 15 turns, of course. Good luck. <laughs> Next is 19x, Prison of Magic. If you beat the last chapter within 15 turns, you have the option to play this chapter. And you should, because it has some good rewards. Uh, it has a Sword Reaver. This is the only one you get for quite a while. Uh, Goddess Icon and uh, a silver card you can steal on the hard modes, Elliwood Hard or Hector Hard. If you want the silver card, you need to you need your Matthew to tie Ion Speed. And according to this website, it's 13. It's possible it might be slightly higher or lower in Hector Hard mode due to random bonuses, but it should be 13. Which means if your Matthew has two speeds level up from base, he should be able to steal the silver card. So bring Matthew for that. Um, other than that, it's a pretty relaxed chapter. Uh, bolting from Ion is very, very strong and scary, but turn 3 Kashuna appears and he blocks this massive radius. Um, everyone inside cannot use magic, so all the mages become fodder, and someone like, I don't know, anyone with speed can just double and kill them. Marcus has a field day in this chapter with the hand axe because he's weapon triangle over all the knights, and he can kill all the mages, and his res is so good, so <laughs> hopefully he's still alive. And uh, yeah. If you want to go to 19xx, then you need to have played Linbode, grinded Nils to level 7 there, and then you have to kill Kashuna, which is super unlikely. Even if you had the best possible setup, which I think is like, you have Raven, Marcus, maybe Lin, I don't know, um, the Silverlands, Killing Edge, Wolf Beal, if they all connect and the Killing Edge crits, then maybe you can kill Kashuna. If you don't kill him within one turn, then he will vanish and you lose your chance at the Guidance. So I'm assuming you're not going to go to 19xx. Uh, it's not really worth it anyway. But it is worth to kill Kishuna's reinforcements. Uh, they're very high level, especially the snipers. I think they're like level 14 snipers. So that's a lot of free XP for your units, especially because chipping them gives a bunch of it. So take advantage of that. Um, but yeah, kill Ion before you kill Kishuna or fight Kishuna at all, because then he's defenseless. It is a bit annoying to kill Ion because he doesn't counterattack, so he doesn't, or he doesn't counterattack, but he also doesn't attack on his face when Kishuna is active. So um, he won't have an Elfire Tome equipped to weigh him down and there's no way to enemy phase him. And there's only one square you can attack him at one range from, which is the space between all the enemies here. Um, so he's pretty hard to kill quickly, but at least he doesn't fight back. So he shouldn't be that bad. Um, other than that, yeah, pretty simple chapter overall. Uh, the Pegasi all have Axe Reavers, I believe, and the Sword Reaver I already mentioned. Keep that in mind. Uh, put like a Sword Unit in range of the Pegasi and you'll, you'll win. 
19xx, you probably haven't seen this chapter if you have played FE7 maybe once. Uh, I've seen this chapter like twice in my life. I don't remember a whole lot about it, so take my tips with a grain of salt. But here's what I remember about the times I did play it. Um, this Ballista, it's in the fog, so, you know, bring anti-fog of war stuff. You know, generally for any fog map, you should bring a Thief and a Torch Staff. Or a Thief and a Torch, at the very least. Uh, torch Staff is, of course, optional, because you might not have it at this point. Uh, but yeah, break the fog. But this Ballista will probably be hidden in the fog, and this Archer can go on top of it. And shoot your units, so keep your Flyers clear. Uh, keep Fragile units out of range for, like, uh, until he's taken care of. Um, these thieves, I remember them being outrageously fast to the point where you can't steal from them. So if they get an item, uh, you probably have to kill them. And there's, that's the only way to get the item back. Um, just, I don't know, look at the map here. Make sure you don't get wrecked by enemies. Particularly the wyverns here are probably scary because they don't move right away. Uh, but if you step here, you can get hit by both and that might be bad for some units. Being in this area also gets you eclipsed by Theodore, but that's a good thing. Uh, if you can quickly take care of the wyverns after he eclipses you, you can go up close to him and fight him before he re-equips Nosferatu. That might be a good idea. Um, but yeah, I don't know how likely it is that you'll get all the chests. Uh, the Digger Shield here is kind of nice to get, but I don't remember how hard it is exactly. Um, but uh, yeah, good luck. It's kind of an annoying map, but I don't remember it being particularly tough. And you don't also miss out on like a lot if you skip it. Dragon's Gate, Chapter 20. This one is tough and fun, and I'm going to talk about it for quite a while because there's a lot to discuss here. Uh, so first of all, um, the the linchpin of this map is Legault. Legault is what determines what makes this map so hard. Or let me just draw a purple circle here. There we go. That's a, that's a nice circle. It's not a nice circle. You don't have to tell me. Uh, anyway, Legault. So what he does is he moves up to this chest and up to this chest, and then he starts going here. And in the end, he will. I think he escapes from here. It's possibly he goes from here, but either way, he's making his way to the top left. So. That's where he'll probably end up being when you meet him. I really recommend taking the left path. So that means going up from here, go through this door, go here, break wall, break wall, break wall, go here. This will give you the most time to meet up with Legault before he escapes. Technically, it's faster to meet him up somewhere else, like around where Darren is or around where the, like this corner over here. But that's really tough to do when you have to play it safe like an Iron Man. So I recommend just taking this path instead. Uh, the hard part about getting to the gold through the middle, especially, is being blocked by this group of cavaliers over here, uh, with the boss uh, Cameron blocking your way. So what I recommend doing is blocking them instead. So um, I think these two guys move right away. You should probably try to kill them as soon as possible. And then this other, the other three are stationary until you get in their range. So what I like to do is I have Marcus around where the knight is, which is out of range of um, the cavaliers and Cameron. And then next turn he moves into this choke point over here this tile right there and that way they can't get through and then you can start sneaking units through here you'll probably need someone like Marcus with one to range because there's uh, hand axe fighters and this mage over here uh, but that's okay you can have Marcus go there next turn so have Marcus go stand here block the way next turn take his place with someone else durable like Oswin or honestly it can be almost anyone who survives the hits of like whichever enemy this is there's probably like one cavalier in front of you and everyone else is being blocked uh, but it's possible there's some nomads there so at your discretion, you might be able to get away with a more fragile unit. Just make sure they like take away their weapons and they will never give up the choke point as long as they can continually heal themselves. Uh, or you just have Sarah or Priscilla there. So, uh, that's pretty easy. Um, and then you just go through here with your other units and get Legault. Uh, it's worth noting for Legault that you have to recruit him with either your main lord or Lin. So, if you're playing Hector mode, Eliwood doesn't work. If you're playing Eliwood mode, Hector doesn't work. So keep that in mind, don't have the wrong character and <laughs> go up to him to try and recruit him because it will not work. Um, and yeah, just have a meet up here. Uh, worth noting, like your lords are forced into this chapter, all of them, even if they're untrained. So keep them very safe. Keep them away from enemies if they're untrained. Uh, sometimes you can get away with like having Link kill someone with Mani Kadi, but be very careful if you're playing a hard Iron Man because it is a game over condition. Trust me, I've been there. <laughs> I have been there. Um, also, Legault, after Legault comes a thief with the member card, have Legault steal that uh, before that thief escapes. Don't kill the thief before he has uh, the member card given up. Reinforcements. This map has quite a few of them. They come from the stairs generally, so there's one here, one here, one here, and then there will be some from the top. Um, but the ones from the stairs are the most urgent to take care of. What I recommend is to meet these reinforcements where they are at, kind of like with Chapter 19, the Dread Isle. Don't wait for them to make things hard for you. Uh, corner them with a unit that has an advantage against them. For example, here you have mostly mercenaries, so send like a cavalier at them. Uh, preferably open this door on turn one with uh, unlock staff or door key 
Um, you should bring a doorkey for this door, by the way. Um, or Matthew or whoever. And then you just have someone walk in. Uh, Dart, unit that only just recently joined, can like one round this uh, archer with the longbow at base with his iron axe or with an iron axe. Uh, that's a good way to start. And then someone else should like plug this uh, stairway at some point uh, once you've taken care of the reinforcements there. There's also a shaman there at one point, but it's mostly mercs, I think. Uh, up here, you can leave this this one alone because the door is closed, but I think at some point it opens. There's like a guy with the door key reinforcing, I think. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe there's nothing here. But uh, you should probably be aware of the Pegasus Knight reinforcements. You can stop all reinforcements by killing Darren. Uh, I'm assuming that's going to take you a while. Uh, like, it's kind of hard to do before some of the reinforcements appear, but that's an option. Uh, these mages, um, they're just Thunder Mages. They can crit someone. Uh, I like to use Kanas to kill them, so you just put Kanas either uh, here or here. And he will enemy phase them uh, before they can break the wall. If they can attack a player unit, they will do that instead of attacking the wall. If they have no one in range, they will go for the wall. So don't let them get out and uh, instead take them one by one um, through the gap here. You can also use a Pegasus Knight with the Javelin. They probably won't one round because the Javelin is heavy, but it's still a pretty good option. Uh, Secret Shop, probably relevant. So Secret Shop, there is one here and there's one here. Let me clear it away here real quick. Uh, so there's one here, and there's one, I think, in this force over here. This bottom right one sells killer weapons, so probably worth a visit, especially if you have the member card and the silver card, in addition to, <laughs> instead of just the member card, because uh, they are quite expensive. Uh, you get a blue gem for one of the chests that you can sell if you have no money at the start of the chapter. Make sure to bring the silver card from preparations. Don't put it on an undeployed character. It can be a Mernless, but don't let it be undeployed. Uh, and get some killer weapons, uh, probably some killer lances, maybe killing edge if you're using someone who can use that. Killer Axe, yeah, it might be nice to get like one or two. Uh, and then on here, this one, I, what I like about this one is it sells lockpicks. Uh, Legault doesn't come with a lockpick, he just has a chest key. So Matthew has your only lockpick, and if you haven't stolen any, then it's a nice opportunity to buy an extra one. Uh, Hector Hard Mode is a bit stingy with lockpicks, so getting one is like nice. Uh, physics stabs are very nice, but they're also very expensive, so you might not have the cash for it. And there's a lot to buy in the upcoming chapters as well, so don't splurge on physics. Get like one or two, that should be enough. Uh, it's a nice emergency heal for Hector Hard Mode, and you don't have one yet, so it's it's good to get one. On that, it's a it's a fun hectic map. Uh, if you do this choke point strategy that I mentioned earlier in the middle, it should be fairly easy. Uh, but it seems like there's always something that can go wrong in Dragon's Gate. So, good luck, have fun. Um, I personally I prefer the have fun part. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, Dragon's Gate for you. New Resolve looks a bit intimidating. Again, it's a Fog of War map, the last one before we can buy Torch Staffs. So if you have a Torch Staff or still have a Thief with a Torch, like, you know, like now it can be Legault instead of Matthew. Then definitely bring them to light up the place. Having a Thief is nice anyway because uh, he has a, what's his name, Oleg. He has a Hero Crest that you can steal. So if you're using anyone who can use that, great. And if not, you can sell the Hero Crest for 5k, uh, which is good because this map is a great opportunity to shop. Um, specifically this Armory and this Fender, I tend to leave the other ones alone. Uh, this armory just sells basic weapons, like one to range weapons, iron weapons. It's good to stock up, because it's been a while since we had opportunity. And it'd also be a while before you have another opportunity. So get all the weapons you need, but save some cash for this shop, because it sells pure waters. Uh, with the silver card, I think they're 450 gold each uh, for three uses. Uh, but they're so helpful to have for Hector Hardpoint. This is the only shop where you can buy them, so definitely visit it. Uh, I like to buy like seven here. And some might die with your units to, you know, Iron Man's being Iron Man's. So you might need extra. Um, maybe not this chapter, maybe not the next, but at some point you'll be very glad to have Pure Waters, trust me. Um, the rest of these chapters is less, less important for sure. Uh, I guess the Elysium Whip is pretty important, especially if you're training a flyer. You should get that one. Uh, it's a bit hard to balance because you do want to get out of this chapter before there's too many reinforcements. As you can see, there's like a bunch of them uh, up to turn 12. I remember this chapter taking a really long time for me the first time I played it on Hector Harp mode. So um, kill Oleg sooner rather than later, but only once you've gotten these three objectives. Uh, the other houses are less important. The first ones are trivial to visit, of course. Uh, the Worm Slayer house over here, uh, it's nice to have, but don't risk your neck over it. This vendor over here, again, it's pretty free to visit because it's close to your starting point. Um, once you're like done with the Silver Card, you should probably have the Silver Card start here, uh, maybe on a flyer and then fly over here, get the shopping done here, and then go over here. Um, but yeah, this is nice to restock on, like, I don't know, Flux if you run out, or um, any Tome or Heal Staff, basically. Um, so yeah, that's this chapter. Fog of War is pretty annoying. Uh, this is technically the second arena. I haven't talked about the arena before, but it's pretty obvious that in Iron Man that the arena is going to be very risky. Hector Heart Mode tends to cheat a little bit with the arena. Um, it puts enemies over stat caps sometimes if your defense is too high in particular, or like give them like better weapons, like steel or silver weapons. So be very, very careful with the arena. You can Ninis Grace someone. 
we make him better than Yurina, that works. I, I guess we should talk about Ninian as well. Yo, uh, post-production mecha here. I just realized there's something important to mention about Ninian's Grace before I forget. You can exploit what is probably an unintended feature of Ninian's Grace a little bit with the arena. What you can do is Ninian's Grace someone, have him go into the arena and take advantage of the plus 10 defense and res. And then at the end of your turn, you can rescue them. And as long as they're in the saddlebags of a unit, they don't lose their Ninian's Grace status. You can drop them next turn. Again, the dance for them with Ninian, have them go in the arena and repeat that process. And the enemies won't see that extra defense as something they have to prepare for. So you get easier, easier matchups that way, like way easier matchups. Um, this also means conversely that status like poison is preserved for longer if you rescue a unit. So if you have a unit poisoned in this chapter, for example, don't rescue them to try and get rid of the poison because the turn counter won't count down. Uh, this goes for out of status effects as well. Uh, Ninian is super, super hard to use in an Iron Man because if you put her in the wrong spot, she might just instantly die. But at the same time, she is so crucial. What I recommend with Ninian is start off every turn before you've moved any units, look at Ninian, look at who the options are for her to dance and pick one. Um, decide, plan the rest of your turn around where Ninian is going to be. That way it's easier to keep her safe and it's easier to figure out, you know, what the optimal use of her. Don't wait until the end of the turn and be like, oh, and I guess I can dance someone. Because then it usually won't be optimal, someone will be out of range. Oftentimes the best person to dance is like a healer or your best combat unit. Um, most of the time anyway. So use it to extend someone's range. Um, and you can also use Ninus Grace, like I said, you can use it in the arena. But Ninus Grace is also just a really, really good thing for an Iron Man. It effectively gives a unit plus 10 defense and resistance. So if someone has like reasonable bulk to begin with, they'll just not die on any face. And that's super handy. And you know, sometimes there's nothing better to do than Ninus Gracing someone. Um, like if you look at right here. There's like five enemies here. You can Ninus Grace someone turn one, like a Cavalier uh, or Marcus. Just send him out here and he'll just enemy phase like everything that comes at him. Not saying you should always do this, but this is something you can do if you're in a pinch or you just want to have a good turn one. Uh, 15 uses last a long time, so make use of it. But the normal dance is of course great too. Uh, if you want more information about dancers and how to use them, uh, I have a Pitfalls video. Don't ditch your dancer. Highly recommend. Before we move on to the next one, I do want to mention that this is a good time to start working on a Guiding Reuser, specifically Urk, Kanas, or Lucius, if you haven't already. Uh, later on, we're going to see a lot of chapters that kind of demand more status staff cures, restore users, basically, and like ways to combat them, like having healing, um, having barrier. So I don't find it's very nice to only have Sarah and Priscilla. Maybe one of them is dead. Uh, you'll get pent later on, but this is a good time to start investing in the staff rank of your Kanas or your Urk, especially because they start at E rank. Lucius starts with C, so he's a lot better off, but you still have to train to level 10. So do work on that now. You have a Fog of War map where you can Torch Staff. If you have your Dread Isle Torch Staff. If you don't, we can buy him next chapter. But start working on that now. We have a Guiding Ring from Dragon's Gate, probably. Might have another one from Zoldam. Invest one of them in Urk or Kanas if you haven't already. Uh, start training your Lucius if you you know, want to use Lucius instead. But definitely do that. So let's move on to Kinship's Bond. Uh, Kinship's Bond is, in my opinion, one of the harder maps in the game. There's no shame in struggling with this one. Uh, it's also one of the best maps in the game just because of how epic this is. So it is technically a defend map. You can sit it out for 11 turns uh, or you can kill the boss. You went all the way in the corner over here. So that is an option you have. No shame in not doing it, but it is a Night Crest and those are pretty rare. So it is nice to get those. But there's plenty of other objectives to worry about as well. And that's the reason why I generally don't like just defending up here. There's a lot of stuff to do and get. So uh, a good way to start off this map, I think, is thinking about the choke points. If you have to fight in this big area over here, uh, it's really hard to protect people like Ninian and like the Force Lords, once again, Elwood and Lin, and anyone else who is here who is like kind of fragile, like your staff user maybe. So that doesn't end well. What you want to do instead is choke the points. It's just isolate one or two enemy at a time and the rest of them get stuck behind them. Uh, but there are a lot of them. There's one here with the door. There's one here. There's another one on the other side. There's one here, there's one here, and then we have the opening of like two squares over here. So there's a lot to cover, but it can be done. And thinking about how to do it, that, leave that up to you. But that's a good tip. Um, for the left door, I like to dedicate Ninian to that one. Um, because it also makes it easier to catch the thief in time, uh, recruit Heath in time. Uh, generally, an extra action here helps more than on here. Uh, on the right side, what you can do is you have Isadora here. Um, put someone in these deployment slots where they can reach her and give her some items, specifically a door key to open this door, and maybe some of the lighter weapons as well, because she has a silver sword, which is good, but it's not the only thing you want her to use. And the short spear is kind of trash on her, so give her, like, maybe a javelin, or some iron weapons, basically. She doesn't have to weigh herself down. 
Um, weapon selection in this chapter is a pretty key point. Uh, every enemy that has one range only has their weapon replaced by a Reaver. I think that's a Hector mode thing, but I'm not entirely sure anymore. But Hector Heart mode definitely has it. So the Wyverns will have Axe Reavers, the Fighters have Sword Reavers, uh, the Thief has a Lance Reaver, and so on. Uh, there's some hand axes in there, um, and of course Nomads don't have Reavers. But generally, you want to get the weapon triangle right in this chapter. Now, fortunately, if you do get it right, then it is very easy to like hold off a choke point or fight an enemy because they have minus 30 hit and minus 2 damage. But if you do it wrong, well, then you face plus 30 hit and minus 2 damage. It also makes it much more likely that you'll miss your attacks against them as well. So use sword units against the wyverns, use lance units against the fighters. Uh, you do have plenty of both, hopefully. Um, let me see what else there is. I got the choke points. Uh, there's the thief that I mentioned earlier. Uh, all the way over here. What he does is he goes in here, opens this door, and then he goes for the treasure over here. Now, there's some scenarios where if you open this door yourself, then maybe an enemy here goes for the door, but generally it's going to be the thief opens the door. Next turn, I think he gets the brave axe from here, and then he goes up to get the 10,000 gold. You want to stop him before he gets the gold because there's no way to get the gold once he's taken it, uh, but you can kill him the turn he gets the brave axe, and you get the brave axe that way. It's probably easier than having your thief do it. But you might want to send a thief or a chest key that way just to get the other chest. Uh, the gold is important because there's also a secret shop over here on this uh, not suspicious tile. If you didn't visit the Dragon's Gate secret shop yet, this is a must visit. If you didn't visit it yet, or if you did visit it, it's still a must visit. Um, there's all the good stabs you can buy here. There's barrier, there's uh, physic, there's torch, and there's probably one I'm forgetting. Uh, you'll want a little bit of everything. Barrier is great for training staff rank beyond C rank. Torch is great next map because it has fog of war and it's a good D rank staff to train your staff rank with. Also just get experience in general. Um, all these staffs are just super important. So um, get one or two off each of them. Um, there's not that many things you have to buy in the near future and you get some more gold in the next chapter. So don't worry about running out of gold. Um, other than that, yeah. Try to play the chapter out. I recommend trying to kill Ubens. Once you've got a chokehold on a chapter, it's not too tough to kill Eubans, but uh, there's probably one quarter you can go for him through, uh, one of these three ways over here, um, but I'll leave that up to you. Alright, so I'm halfway through my footage, but as you guys can see, you're at the end of the video because I want to split it into two parts after realizing just how long my recordings total were. So we're going to save the next one for probably next week, like this is going to be posted like one week apart at most. So that's going to be part two, uh, stay tuned for that, subscribe if you haven't already, uh, leave a comment about what you liked, what you didn't like, and I'll see you next time. Thank you for watching and uh, hope this was helpful.